Come to our study in the doctrine of God after looking at several of God's attributes and looking at our one God existing in three persons to the vital subject of theodicy. And don't let the fancy theological term uh, dissuade you from uh, attention. Theodicy, as we posted on our Facebook advertisement today, is just reconciling a good God and an evil world. After hundreds of years of history filled with the foremost thinkers, I am not coming to you as your pastor pretending to have the final word or to put to rest the whole debate over a sovereign good God existing at the same time that there is sin and evil and suffering on planet Earth. Just seeking to be faithful to stimulate biblical thinking about the subject. Though man charges God in a trial fashion, God needs no defense. He doesn't need mine. He doesn't need yours. Um, You know, God's truth, as Spurgeon said, it's like a lion needing no defense. You know, as a lion... Doesn't need defense, you just let him out of his cage. Same with the word of God. Just teach the word of God, teach the truth about God. He, he defends himself. You know, he is good. Desiring the good and even the happiness of his creatures. Otherwise, his own beloved son would not follow blessing after blessing in the Beatitudes in the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew chapter 5 of the truly happy one. Nor would the psalmist begin the the entire section of the book of Psalms by blessed or happy the one that, and he fills in the details. So God is good, desiring the good and happiness of his creatures. He is sovereign, absolute power to accomplish his will. Thirdly, that evil does exist, including all the natural disasters, personal tragedies, And so man asks the question, how can an all-powerful, loving God allow such suffering and injustice and evil? Why did he take my baby from me? Why did he allow 9-11? Why does he allow child molestation? Why does he allow disease as you sit with your loved one or friend dying of cancer or something else. So they ask that question. How can an all-powerful, loving God allow such suffering and injustice and evil? Years ago, after Rabbi Kushner lost his son, he published a book. Why do bad things happen to good people? Well, sorry, Rabbi Kushner, but there are no good people. We're all sinners. Uh, There was one, and he volunteered for the job to the injustice that we looked at a couple of weeks as he faces a mock illegal trial and dies as a criminal. Well, that's coming up in Mark's account. So theodicy is the problem of evil in the world that attempts logically and relevantly and consistently to defend God as simultaneously omnipotent, all-powerful, all-loving, and just, despite the reality of evil's existence. You know, I remember the the first time I dealt with this subject was the 9-11 attacks. And then I had to lean into it again Nine and a half years ago, as my town had the slaughter of many innocent kids in the Sandy Hook shooting. It just keeps on going. And it's not the last school shooting. It's not the the last mass issue. Then you have to lean into this again for the Alameda fires. When two towns are decimated, tragedy galore. But trials, tribulation should not take us by surprise. Our Savior said in John sixteen thirty three, in the world, you'll have tribulation. It's part and parcel of being human. Your know, holy creator God created the world without sin. Genesis 1, Genesis 2. 
You get to chapter 3 of Genesis, and the world literally goes to hell in a handbasket. Sin enters the picture. You get to chapter 4, you got the first murder in human history, Cain and Abel. Lucifer is cast down, working wickedness as he has been a murderer from the beginning, Jesus said in John 8, 44. You have the rest of scripture. Until you come to the, the last couple of chapters at the end of the Bible, when the curse is done away, you go into the eternal state. Other than the first two chapters of the Bible and the last two chapters of the Bible, the entire inscripturated revelation of God has to do with sin in a cursed, wicked, sinful, broken world. Originally, God called it all good. Turn to John 11, if you would. And we haven't even gotten off the, uh, the title slide. So fasten your seatbelts. Uh, John 11. This is uh, the familiar story of the death and resurrection of Lazarus, uh, a friend of Jesus. Jesus healed people. He produced multiplied food in front of people, feeding thousands of people. He took care of disease issues. He cast demons out. And he raises people from the dead. And so the question came up. In regards to his friend, why'd you let him die? Oh, by the way, I, uh, is that better, uh, guys? I, I never unmuted myself. All you guys got to do is dance back there and let me know, get my attention that I, yes, as, as our other son guys are there. Hi, Karumba, pastor's never going to learn. I apologize. Uh, I hope our live streamers can hear me now. Uh, can you hear me now? I feel like a bad commercial. John 11, verse 4. When Jesus had heard about Lazarus being sick, he said, This sickness is not to end in death, but is for the glory of God, so that the Son of God may be glorified by it. So death's not the end of the story. Sickness isn't the end of the story. It's not all about that. There's a, 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 a bigger issue. Go down to verse 15, if you would. You know, he says, I'm glad for your sakes that I was not there. What happened uh, right before verse 15, verse 14? Lazarus' sickness ended up in death. And that's why Jesus said, I'm glad I wasn't there. Uh, you know, think about them scratching their heads at this point. What do you mean? You're glad you weren't there to prevent Lazarus' death. He said, I'm glad I wasn't there so that you may believe. You know, what are you going to do? About the gospel. Go down to verse 40. Jesus said to her, did I not say to you that if you believe, you will see the glory of God? Verse 45. A therefore. You come to a therefore when you study in scripture, you ask yourself the question, what is therefore? So we're reaching a culmination, a conclusion to this account. A real account in real history. We're told that many of the Jews who came to Mary and saw what he had done believed in him. What had he done? Well, he didn't stop Lazarus' sickness. He was glad he wasn't there during the sickness part. He's glad that he came after death so that he had manifest that this man before them wasn't just a man. This is the God-man. It's about eternity. So let's go on a journey about how, how God can use man's greatest fear, death, for his glory and for our good. And this is before we even develop the lesson. You know, to start with gospel hope. You want to answer the question of theodicy? Let's think through a gospel lens. You know, there's an article in the foyer uh, right next to where your handouts are uh, that I'd uh, written on the subject, so I told you right after the Sandy Hook shooting, um, I had uh, not only made it a point to teach on this to our adult Sunday school class, but uh, to write for my student, my theology students at the university, for our people in Newtown. 
Because there needs to be answers. And the Bible is not silent. God is not silent about the issue of his goodness in spite of the, uh, uh, the, the words escaping, um, just the, the, the wickedness on planet Earth. You know, possibly for many, the greatest pain is the slaughter of children mercilessly cut down. But we know that any child who doesn't has, hasn't come to the point of accountability, instant heaven with the Lord. They're spared life in a cursed world. And who knows what kind of heartache and pain and sin they were preserved from. You know, let's uh, go back from John to Luke. And uh, let me give you one more gospel note before we flip the slides and move on to our lesson. As we think about there, there must be more to this than what we can figure out in our fallen sinful logic. We're, we have such a limited perspective as humans. Luke 13. Basically, Jesus saying repent or perish. In the Luke 13 verse 1. At that time, there were some present who were reporting to him, speaking of Jesus, about the Galileans whose blood Pilate had mixed with their sacrifices. And Jesus answered and said to them, do you think that these Galileans were greater sinners than all other Galileans because they suffered these things? Again, in in, uh, Jewish theology, you know, it's like if something's bad in your life, you must have done something and God's getting you for it. And that's why Jesus uses his teaching event. He says in verse 3, I tell you no, but unless you repent, you all likewise perish. It's not a matter of them being more wicked sinners than other sinners on planet Earth. That's not why this this, uh, tragedy happened. Verse 4, or do you think that those 18 on whom the Tower of Siloam fell and killed them were worse offenders than all the men who lived in Jerusalem? I tell you no. So Jesus asks a question and answers his own question, says, and then he he convicts them, commands them that unless you repent, you're going to perish just like them. It's a matter of eternity that what we experience on planet Earth is just uh, the beginning. You think it's painful and sinful and at times hopeless on planet Earth? This is just a picture of what it's going to be out of God's presence for eternity. This is the closest. If you're a believer, this is the closest you'll ever experience of hell. And uh, if you haven't trusted Christ and you die today, um, this is the best time of your eternity. So flee to him. Gospel opportunities. You know, we want to have a reason to share the hope that lies within. Peter says. But we just don't want to point people to man. We want to point them to God. You know, that's why when I was in Sandy Hook, before we moved uh, across the nation to come out here, I was so offended by a lot of the clergy in our town. So-called ministers of the gospel. All the news anchors flock to our little town. Microphones in front of pastors. And they were saying things like, well, I don't know. I wish we could make sense of the slaughter of the kids and the teachers. I wish I knew what to say. Many of them were saying. Well, sir, could I please politely ask you to be quiet and sit down and let somebody who's got an answer speak. Church, we know what our mission is. Get the job done. Wherever our conversations intersect with people on planet Earth, we got to get them to the cross. We know what our mission is. Whether it's the Alameda fires, another school shooting, the loss of a loved one, it's about eternity. So, let's get into our lesson. Number one, we must... Recognize the fact of evil's existence. You don't have to be very old in life. You don't have to get to adulthood to realize that there's going to be plenty of experiences that you're done dirty in injustice 
and life is going to have a fair amount of pain with it. None question this fact except Christian scientists. Well, Christian science is neither Christian nor science, but that's for another lesson another time. To them, all evil is an illusion. You know, in, in Eastern religions, you've got Buddhism and Hinduism. So everyone else on planet Earth accepts this reality. Evil is here. There are different forms of evil. Number one, there's natural evil, like disease and disaster, to alliterate since I am a preacher and teacher. Uh, Disease and disaster. Ever since the fall, ever since Genesis 3, man has lived subject to the cursed earth. There's famine, part of experience. There is earthquakes. There is fires. Even fire season coming up. No matter how much rain comes, it's always coming, right? Right? Uh, Genetic defects, tsunamis, you fill in the blank here of all the natural evil that this planet and humanity experiences. Number two, there's moral evil, spiritual sin, personal bent of man, man's attitude. Even his thinking is is uh, not quite plumb. It's affected by our sinfulness. We can't even think ourselves out of paper bag, theologically speaking. So when we're talking about moral evil, massacres is a moral issue. Child molestation, murder. These are all atrocities at the hands of fellow sinners. When somebody is, um, you you, you say, okay, what about uh, somebody hit by a drunk driver? Is that a a moral evil? They, They made choices in their drunkenness to go out and sit behind a wheel. You know, the, uh, the most recent, was it a week ago or two weeks ago that we had that, uh, the, the worst school shooting since Sandy Hook uh, nine years ago? And then follow up a, a few days later with the medical center, four more people cut down. So there's a lot of moral evil. The Bible needs to be our primary source for attempting to understand this issue, especially since we're going to have questions until glory. Until we get in our glorified state. Only the sufficient word of God answers the deep questions of life, giving an authoritative view of man. A biblical anthropology. You know, if you, if you start in the wrong place, you're going to end up with the wrong answers. Again, to um, uh, give some illustrations just from my own experience, you know, when we had the Sandy Hook shooting... Um, you got your psychologists and your mental health industry was treating Adam Lanza, the murderer, as a victim. He never was quite right in the head, and that is why he did this. No, Adam Lanza did this is because he's a sinner with a hateful heart. Go back to the first murder of the Bible. Diagnosis that immoral issue. You know, and then you get your liberal politicians involved who went after the guns. Again, you start in the wrong area, you're going to get to the wrong conclusion, the wrong answers. That's why we we start with the Bible that diagnoses this as a heart issue. There must be a gospel change of the heart. Our stony heart needs to be taken out and replaced with a heart of flesh. Only the gospel does that. Well, and then we've we've got supernatural evil. The Bible gives us a fair amount of theology about the supernatural. As a matter of fact, I was I was asked about it in regard. Was it yesterday? Angels came up or the day before? Whenever it was, um, you know, Revelation twelve. The dragon is thrown down from heaven, banished from heaven to ply his wares here on planet Earth. Along with an unseen demonic host, half of the original created angels became demons. Well, First John 2.18, many antichrists have come. Before the great antichrist, capital A, comes a lot of antichrists. This is the spirit of our age. When Paul ends his letter to the saints at Ephesus in Ephesians 6.12, and he urges them, peel back the blinders of your eyes to look on the unseen realm, the supernatural. 
when he says to them, we don't wrestle against flesh and blood. And it seems like a very fleshly battle when you're dealing with uh, whether it be disease you're dealing with or philosophical systems, you're talking to people. Seems like it's got a well, you know, blood and flesh right in front of our eyes. It's not. He says it's not wrestling against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers. Our war is against rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. You want to know where the war really rages in our present experience? Not with what we see and observe, but what we can't see and can't observe. It's a war for our souls and other souls. And if, if, if the dragon has lost believers to God, the best he can do is trip us up. Do you think he's passive towards the church? The adversary would desire nothing better than to split Grace Bible Church wide open into a million pieces. Be sober and vigilant for your adversary, the devil, walks about, prowls about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he can devour. First Peter 5 8. You add in Romans 5.12. Paul says that sin and death entered the world through the sin of Adam. You want to answer the question about evil on planet Earth? You go to the Bible, you go back to Genesis 3, and it continued on. So you get to chapter 6 of Genesis, that as Moses parses the heart of man, that the thoughts and intents of his heart was only evil continually. Why'd God wipe out a planet, save a man and a few relatives and some animals, sin. If you don't entertain sin, you can never come to the answer. Sin is a huge piece of a biblical and Christian worldview. If you erase sin from the picture, you're not going to get the answer. You know, as we, we think about supernatural evil, the demonic, 1 Kings 22 Verses 20 to 23, it speaks of a deceiving spirit that was involved with Ahab. Now, Ahab was the flesh and blood front runner of evil atrocities, but he was empowered and moved by the murder from the beginning, Satan himself. And so we've got world systems charged by the enemy of our souls. We can see the human component, but not see the supernatural. You know, though Lanza did the shooting in Sandy Hook Elementary School, John eight forty four, Satan's a murder from the beginning, empowering his own children. You know, the Bible teaches that every one of us are born children of the devil until we are adopted into God's forever family by faith and, you know, held hostage to do his will. And then there's eternal evil. That's what the Bible teaches about hell. But again, that's another Lesson for another time. So we, we, we start off and answer number one with the fact of evil's existence. Nobody denies this except for people who have the heads in the sand about reality. If I could put it as nicely as possible. Madison, could you uh, advance the slide for me since the computer's being persnickety? Number two, the fact of God's existence. Let me back up a little. We need to establish not only the fact of evil's existence, but the fact of God's existence. He's the creator God. He's perfectly holy. Insert here in our thinking all that we've been studying the last several weeks on Wednesdays in our Doctrine of God series. Where'd we start? There is only one God, God of the Bible, revealed in Scripture. We looked for six or seven weeks. I'd have to go back and look at my notes to see how many. It was either six or seven weeks we, we spent on his attributes. And every single individual attribute are present in God in their totality at all times together. So that the God of love is also the God of wrath. Well, that is to say that 
He exists with all his attributes, his holiness, his love, his justice, including his sovereignty. The old Baptist preacher Spurgeon said, no doctrine in the whole word of God has more excited the hatred of mankind than the truth of the absolute sovereignty of God. And dear friends, I dare you, those of you that are involved in social media, I dare you tonight or tomorrow, post anything about election on social media to get the firestorm started. Now, some of you have. And you type out your response and then you erase it because that's not the best format for engaging people. Actually, I... uh, used to have several students in an essay that was required for class use the famous free will defense. You were trying to answer the question, sin and evil on planet Earth, sovereign and good God at the same time? And so the free will defense says, well, um, who's responsible for evil? Man is. Because we've got to get God off the hook as if his shoulders aren't big enough to... to, uh, Bear it. Yeah, we can contemplate the issue, but not put God on trial. Not on your slide. Um, You know that I'm many times in my devotions in Psalms. Psalm 7 was in my devotions this morning, but not too long ago, I think in the five-day Bible reading plan that we've been doing as a church. Is Psalm 73. Asaph gives us a lament psalm. What do we do with the lament psalms? The psalmist teaches us how to vent our lament to God. The whole difference is the posture of the heart. We're not being persnickety and questionable. We're really bringing our sorrows and our... Like, God, there's, there's tension here. I'm bearing my soul out to you. How much longer, O oh Lord? Again, you're not shaking your fist in his face. So those psalms of lament show us what that balance looks like. Psalm 73, 21 and 22. Your Job schools us a lot as to what this looks like. What we're saying is nothing happens outside the plan of God. Yeah, you know, the the point is, if you know, when you get to Job thirty eight verses one to four, beginning of chapter forty, beginning of chapter forty two. Remember what happens there in Job thirty eight to forty two. After Job's sorry, sinful counselors come to the table. God castigates all them and Job and schools Job in a big view of himself. Where were you? Since you know so much, where were you at the creation? When I just flung the stars out into existence. Boy, that really humbles us. And God's teaching Job that if you're so ignorant concerning God's works in the natural world, how can you... Expect to understand the workings of God's mind in distributing good and evil. And so Job shuts his mouth and simply trusts. You know, actually, uh, Job's question throughout the book of Job. Why this? Why that? This is our questions. God, why Job almost let me die years ago? Why have we got four little ones in heaven waiting for us to come along? When difficulties come, why? And his question gets changed. Not to why God this, why God that, but who? Who are you worshiping, Job? Not why do bad things happen to good people as if there are good people. Paul says that in Romans 3, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. There is how many righteous? Righteous. None. No, not one. So instead of this entitlement attitude as humans, as if God is obligated to us, he is the great God who is glorious. He is past searching out and owes us nothing. 
Nothing happens outside the plan of God. And contrary to the clergy that day, you know, I, uh, when I uh, got a, the Newtown Bee was our local newspaper in, in Newtown, Connecticut. Let me quote some of the clergy. Quote, we believe God would never cause tragedy to happen. He is there to comfort families and the children with him now in heaven, without a doubt. God did not take these children. Well, actually, he did take the children and did not receive, uh, reached the condition of accountability. He took them to himself, spared them a wealth of pain and difficulty in planet Earth. Because in his sovereign hidden wisdom, that was the best thing. Romans eight twenty eight and 29 assures us he's working everything together for our good, for his glory. He's bringing and meeting things out in our lives if it's going to produce Christ likeness. Verse 29. You know, so that Joseph could say at the end of injustice after injustice, you know, his brothers uh, leaving a pit for dead. Well, let's go back to the pit and pull him out. We'll, we'll sell him. We'll actually make some money on his death. And the one sent into Egypt land in the providence of God at the right time could save his entire family from the famine that came about. What you guys meant for evil, he says to them, looking them eyeball to eyeball, God meant for good. We can't see that this side of eternity. He can sovereignly and graciously work even evil for eternal good. You know, to God, from his perspective, there is no problem of evil. It's not insurmountable to him. You know, there's a, a whole list of references there on the bottom of your slide. We're not going to go to them all. But just, you know, you've got the references there to look up and make sure I'm being honest and not giving you bad addresses. Don't bother to turn there. Just, just think with me through a few of them. You know, in 1 Corinthians 29, 11, we're told that God owns all. Verse 12, he controls all. What do you suppose all means? All is all all means. Owns all because he created it all and it controls all. In uh, Exodus 4, verse 11, he's... Offering up all of his, when, when, when he uh, is told to take off your sandals, the place where you're standing is holy ground because he, he pulled aside to this bush that was burning but not burning up. And it's like, wow, I got to get in on this. And God gives him his mission. You're going to go and uh, say, let my people go. And he's offering all his excuses why he couldn't lead God's people because he doesn't understand God, the great I am. Tell him I am sent you. In Psalm 105, verse 16, God called for a famine. You go back to those Sandy Hook clergy who are saying God doesn't take. God is the one that causes calamity. He raises up kings to take down those same kings to display his glory. So in Psalm 105, 16, God called for a famine. Verse 17, he sent a man before them, Joseph. So the psalmist is looking back to the Exodus account. He's sold as a slave. God using man's evil intent of selling into slavery. What good could be brought about from such injustice of slavery? And yet he did so for his own glory and even the good of his people in saving them during the times of famine. They had no idea was coming later on down the pike. In 2 Kings 17.25, we're told that God sent lions among them because they didn't fear God. So what might have fear, what, what might look like God is opposed and against us could be at times his gentle fatherly hand of, of discipline getting us back in the line of right, the path of righteousness that we would not respond to unless it was painful and difficult. 
we wouldn't run his way automatically. And so he gives us those opportunities where we got no choice but to run to him as our rock, our refuge, and our deliverer. So when it comes to evil and suffering, rather than castigate God, we must look to man's sin. Um, You know, in a periodical, The Times, a question was asked, what's wrong with the world? To which G.K. Chesterton responded, in response to your question, what's wrong with the world? I am. I am. So we recognize that there's evil. We recognize there is God. And this God, I can't figure out. He doesn't do things the way I would do things. You know, who who sent the, the flood? The greatest calamity ever to hit earth. God did. You know, this is, as Paul teaches his disciple Timothy, he who is blessed and the only sovereign, the king of all earthly kings and the Lord of every earthly Lord. That's who. In Revelation 4.11, Jesus is worthy to receive glory and honor and power for you created all things and because of your will they existed and were created. In Revelation 4, Jesus is worthy based on him being creator. Verse uh, In chapter 5, he is worthy because he is redeemer. Proverbs 16, 4. The Lord has made everything for its own purpose, even the wicked for the day of evil. You know, there are few miracles in the Old Testament that are not judgment. You know, he does what he sees, sees fit. You see, evil is really no disruption to his plan. You know, when you get to the trial of Jesus that we just studied two weeks ago and you get into chapter 15 where there's another false trial by the Gentile leaders and he goes, this is, this is the worst evil and it looks like a, a uh, good plan gone awry if it were not in the eternal purpose of God. So we've we've got to get to the point, number three, of God's decree. If God is all sovereign, nothing catches him off guard. He wills evil's existence. Now go back with me, if you would, to Isaiah 45. Isaiah 45. You know, if God didn't will it, evil wouldn't exist. In Isaiah 45... Look with me, if you would, at verse 5. He says, I am Yahweh, and there is no other. Besides me, there is no God. I will gird you, though you have not known me, that they may know from the, you know, that, uh, the that at the beginning of verse 6 is a, is a purpose clause. You know, this is why he does it. That they might know from the rising to the setting of the sun that there is no one besides me. I am Yahweh, and there is no other. The one forming light... Notice this, and creating darkness, producing peace and creating calamity. I am Yahweh who does all these. Skip down to verse nine, if you would. Woe to the one who contends with his maker, an earthenware vessel among the vessels of earth. Will the clay say to the potter, what are you doing? Or the thing, or the thing you are making say he has no hands? Woe to him who says to a father, what are you begetting? Or to a woman, with what are you in labor pains? So God decrees evil's existence. You know, it's it's great. You know, you notice how we accept all the good things from God. And the moment calamity happens, we wonder... Your sleep, God? 
You know, or you can go to the name it, claim it cloud and they'll tell you a uh, crowd that will tell you that anytime there's disease or difficulty, Satan's doing it. They wouldn't dare say God's doing calamity. God tells us in scripture he does it both. And yet he's not, even though God wills evil's existence, he's not responsible for sin. He's absolutely holy. You know, so, you know, the, the Arminians are having a heart attack at this point in our in our study. At this point, they want to rescue God. That he's got limited power or he just doesn't know how man's going to respond. You know, they place the blame on man to get God off the hook. And yet, who are we? the created, to answer back and question God. The finite in judgment of the infinite. Well, not only is Arminian theology an error, but even unbelievers just can't get to where we're, where we're going right now. Blinded, human logic, Once you come to faith in Christ and you begin the Christian journey of faith, there is a presupposition of faith and obedience to the authority of Scripture. It's no longer a matter of fighting and feuding. When somebody comes to Christ, there's the acceptance that we receive the word of God, not as the word of men, but as it really is the word of God. That presupposition of faith. So that, you know, either... God doesn't know evil would happen. That's openness theology. When I resigned the ministry in Maine, moved to the concrete, God forsaken concrete jungle of L.A. to go to seminary. The faculty lecture series that year was on open theism. Rank Arminian theology. So because man hasn't made a choice yet, he doesn't know how to respond and to do the best juggling act. So either God doesn't know how, no no evil would happen, that's openness theology, or he doesn't have power to overcome it, that's process theology. You see, these, these false views just don't measure up. They reinvent God. It's not the weakness of God, but... Um, It's the logic of creation that uh, we try to apply to the situation. You know, we've already studied God's omnipotence. What is his omnipotence, his, his attribute, his perfection of omnipotence? He is, uh, has limitless power so that even when he spoke the world into existence, there wasn't one iota of fatigue Yeah, that's why we lean into him. You know, Isaiah 40 would be a whole sermon in itself on that. We've already studied his omnipotence. We've studied how he is incomprehensible. And yet we are able to grow in our knowledge of him, the greatness and glory and majesty of our sovereign God. So, either God doesn't know evil would happen. Or he doesn't have power to overcome it. Or he didn't stop it for some, quote, higher reason. Yes, God is the higher being, but we bring him down to our higher court of what is just. He doesn't he love? Doesn't he care? Well, I'd answer those questions. He died for us. The father killed the son for sinners. That's what Peter preaches in Acts 2, 23. So when we look at, okay, who's responsible for the death of Jesus? You've got death, not by Satan, even though Satan is responsible. Death at the hands of the Romans because the religious crowd didn't have the power of death and crucifixion. And even though the the Jewish religious crowd had their part that they own up to. The father smote the son to accomplish our redemption. Each of those parties are guilty and culpable for their transgression and sin. And yet God uses the most exceedingly unjust and wicked atrocities to advance his purpose and his glory. 
So we have to get to the point of realizing that God doesn't view other people's wills above his own will. People love to talk about free will. I have no qualms. We are rational creatures that we make choices. I just don't know how we equate Romans 3 that we're dead in our... or, or, or uh, we're, we're dead in our sins, Ephesians 2... We're depraved. None does good. And so how free is that will? The ability to choose. You know, he does what he does because it's right. What he does is right. He's the absolute standard for right. He's too wise to be wrong and too kind to be cruel. So somehow, God had a purpose for it. You know, as you go back to the the Westminster Confession. You know, actually, let me uh, let me just go back to the title. Take your Bibles, run over to Romans nine. Romans nine, and uh, we'll probably conclude our our time here. Romans nine. Romans 9, verse 17. For the scripture says to Pharaoh, for this very purpose, I raised you up in order to demonstrate my power in you and in order that my name might be proclaimed throughout the whole earth. So the the same Yahweh who took Pharaoh down is the one that had exalted him to his office in the first place. You know, If God had a purpose, what would it be? It would be to manifest the full array of his attributes. It's all about his glory. So back to the Westminster Catechism. You know, um, what is the chief end of man? Glorify God and enjoy him forever. Why does God do what he does? It's all for the praise of his glory. That is the repeated phrase in Ephesians 1. All for the praise of his glory. You know, the... Westminster, they, they had over 1,100 meetings for 10 years. And they come to that simple but high truth. You know, in John 9, don't bother to go there because we're going to finish in Romans. Um, in John 9, verse number 2, you know, there, Jesus and his disciples are passing by a blind man who's been blind ever since he was born. Think, what good can occur? You, you know, a blind man can't see the, the beautiful colors of the flowers that are coming out right now. And They asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he would be born blind? Jesus answered, neither the man nor his parents sinned, but this was so that the works of God might be manifested in him. You guys' view is too low. It's too myopic. It's too small in focus. Not the guy's problem, not his parents' problem. God's got a big purpose behind the scenes that he's working about for his glory. You know, so to say that is to say that God receives more glory from his creatures because sin exists. You know, somehow in the sovereign, mysterious wisdom of God, God is more glorious because we were so lost and could do nothing about it. God launched a rescue effort through his own son and slaughtered his son as a substitute for sinners. You know, it's to put his righteousness on display. Otherwise, God wouldn't be able to demonstrate his righteousness. What's better? A holy race or a redeemed race? A redeemed race more fully demonstrates this. can only st- understand that if there's unrighteousness. Can we understand, you know, the black backdrop of unrighteousness makes righteousness so glorious. God demonstrated his own love toward us and while we're yet sinners, Christ died for us. Romans 
to demonstrate his wrath. The cross is the greatest display of the love of God against what backdrop? The backdrop of sin that man couldn't do anything about. The only thing we contribute to our salvation is all the sin that made it necessary. He paid it all, all to him we owe. So to demonstrate his righteousness, to demonstrate his love, to demonstrate his wrath. You know, since we were in Romans 9, you know, Verse 22. And what if God, wanting to demonstrate his wrath, to make his power known, endured with much patience vessels of wrath having been prepared for destruction? Do you know that God is not only going to be glorified for eternity from those he's redeemed in his presence in heaven for all of eternity, but God is going to be glorified in his wrath poured out on sin for eternity? That's a hard, tense doctrine, but a true one. He demonstrates his wrath. He demonstrates his mercy. It is not fathomable. Look at verse 23. Or order that he might make known to us the riches of his glory upon vessels of mercy, which he prepared beforehand for glory. Even us, whom he also called. It's not fallible, but it is clear. I've exhausted more than my time, so we've got to kind of conclude here. Um, you know, as you, when you get to Romans 9... We stop asking the question, why didn't God choose so-and-so? We look at ourselves as wretches. We see nice, kind family members, bosses, neighbors. Why didn't God choose so-and-so? We ought to occupy ourselves with the question, why did he, why did he choose me? Why did he lavish his love through the death of his son for a scumbag, a religious hypocrite who was so lost, he didn't even know his lostness. Does evil make God appear more glorious or less? You know, before sin... He wasn't worshipped fully for his glory, his love, his wrath, his holiness, and mercy. Genesis 1, Genesis 2, there is no sin in the picture. But God. You know, in the same chapter of of, uh, Genesis 3, where sin enters the picture, you've got the first promise of Messiah, who's coming to bruise the head of the serpent, even though that serpent will bruise his heel. Now... Against the backdrop of sin, rebels, and unrighteousness, he is exceedingly glorious, dear friends. And the greatest Old Testament example is found here in this chapter. Verse 14, Romans 9, 14. What shall we say then? Is there any unrighteousness with God? May it never be. For he says to Moses, I'll have mercy on whom I have mercy. I'll have compassion on whom I have compassion. So then it doesn't depend on the one who wills or the one who runs, but on God who has mercy. For the scripture says to Pharaoh, for this very purpose, I raised you up in order to demonstrate my power in you and in order that my name might be proclaimed throughout the whole earth. So then he has mercy on whom he desires. He hardens whom he desires. Why? Did God love me? He loved me because he loved me. He chose me because he chose me. End of story. You know, we would never be so charged up in our worship, in our adoration, and our praise if we had not been rescued from such evil. Though we still live in an evil world, it does not affect us like those that know not God. Because we've got a friend that sticks close to the brother walking through the ills of life with us our great high priest will spend forever bowing at his feet singing worthy is the lamb hallelujah so we end where we began pointing others to god 
during difficulty like suffering and suffering for the glory of God. You know, keep your eyes on the inheritance being kept by the power of God. Rejoice. Knowing that it's getting worse, not better. It won't disappear until the Prince of Peace comes. Until you get to the last two chapters of the Bible, Revelation 21 and 22, when sin is no more. Everything is good, the first two chapters of the Bible. It will be again untainted by sin's presence. And in the in-between time, Deuteronomy 29, 20 time, 29, the secret things belong to the Lord. There's a lot of questions we've got no answers to, but we still have a sovereignly good God to trust. He's given us sufficient revelation. It's up to us to dig in, to study, to learn, to share, to teach, and point them to the Savior and the all-sufficient Word written and incarnate. And it's not just for an answer for them, but for our own soul's sanctification and worship. Father, thank you for your truth. Help us to think clearly and biblically about the questions and issues of life. Always being ready to give a reason for the hope that lies within. Thank you for disclosing yourself as not just a God who is angry with the wicked every day, but sets your love on sinners and is continuing your work of saving sinners for your own praise and glory. Continue it through our meager but faithful efforts. For your glory we ask it. Amen.